Remember the last time you were sick? Maybe it was a cold or a stomach bug or COVID-19. You probably told your friends and family about it. Let your boss and coworkers know why you couldn't come to work. Hey, you may have even posted about it on Insta or Twitter, but what if you were struggling with your mental and not your physical health? Odds are you kept that to yourself. Both are health issues. So why the silence? My name is Lauren and I host the YouTube channel called Living Well with Schizophrenia. I was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder back in 2016. So schizoaffective disorder is basically the combination of schizophrenia and a major mood disorder such as bipolar or depression. I first started noticing that something was kind of off and experiencing symptoms in high school. You know, back then that was like 12 years ago and you know, mental health wasn't really talked about as much then. It wasn't as, um, you know, open of a dialogue back then. And so I was really, really scared and filled with self stigma. Stop right there. You hear that? I was really, really scared and filled with self stigma. Heard that term before? Self stigma. It's like a subcategory of stigma. From now on, think of the word with three different layers called self, social and structural. What we normally think of when uh, you hear the term stigma is probably social stigma. It's the discrimination and the insults and the slurs and the microaggressions that people might encounter. That's Iva Chung. She's a professional editor that focuses on public health and policy language. So when you have social stigma, you know, you, you have people who believe that people with mental illness are violent, for instance, or can't be trusted with children, for instance. And in a lot of cases, that's a really unfair perception of what mental illness is. It was actually language that I was hearing from like podcasts or like YouTube videos or like people like my, my peers in the same industry in the same space. So um, I really felt like I was just being too dramatic or being too lazy. Like I felt like it, it was my own fault that I was feeling this way. Asia is an actress and YouTuber. A couple of months ago, she shared her mental health journey with more than 400,000 subscribers. Therapy saved my life and I would highly recommend it for anyone who has uh, the means to go to therapy. I have a family history of anxiety and depression and I kind of just brushed it off when I was younger. There was a lot of stigma, obviously, because you know I'm uh, black and Asian and uh, mental health is so stigmatized in both of those communities. When you internalize that stigma, that can do a lot of damaging uh, things to the, the, your outlook on, on life. So if you're told over and over that you have this chronic illness that will never get better and you're doomed never to succeed, then why would you even bother trying? You have this own narrative within yourself that something is wrong with you, you are broken, people are going to judge you, your life is going to be worse if you come forward with this struggle that you're facing. And it, it can be quite debilitating. That leaves structural stigma, which refers to discriminatory ideas or rules that exist at a systematic level. For example, policies that might deny housing, jobs, or healthcare opportunities to people with mental health issues. But here's the thing, mental health doesn't just look one way. You have to accept that you're your own person and other people are separate from you. We have so many misconceptions still about mental health. There's this one that we think that people are either mentally healthy or they're not. So we think that if you have depression, you're mentally ill, but if you don't have depression, then you must be mentally healthy. That's not the case. Mental health is a continuum. Nathan Smith wanted to make that clear with his blog, My Brain's Not Broken. For years, he's been working to destigmatize mental health by sharing his own story. It can be seen as just a reason not to hire someone, a reason, you know, not to go on a date with someone, a reason not to be friends with someone. Like there's. There, there's more reasons to not associate um, with someone who's living with mental health issues than there are to maybe seek them out and maybe to find out what their experience is like because they have a lot to offer. And so I think along my mental health journey, I think I've just learned how the language is a key part of how the stigma persists. The euphemism treadmill describes a phenomenon where we coin a word to describe something usually clinical or in a detached way, but then people start using that term in a pejorative way and it becomes an insult and a slur. Uh, and because of that, 
we now need to come up with a whole new term to describe that very same phenomenon. You're in a situation where you have to keep inventing new words to replace the one that has been turned into a slur. On this treadmill are words a lot of people use every day. Words like crazy, insane, or psycho. At one point, all three were used to describe people with varying medical conditions. But now they're used as insults or ways to emphasize a point, typically in a negative way. I think there's just a lot of words within the mental health community that people don't realize are just uh, not even just rude, but also just inaccurate um, and not, not super helpful and um, don't actually get the point across that they think they're making. Using mental health diagnoses as descriptive language for something. So, oh, the weather is so bipolar today, or that test was totally schizophrenic. You know, reducing those diagnoses to describe something that really it shouldn't be describing. It doesn't sound like it's that big of a deal because of the, probably the amount of times that we've heard that language, but once you're aware of how that affects people, you kind of have to dovetail it with well, here's some new words you can use. And the words you're using are actually connected to mental health and mental illness. And I don't think that's what you mean. Language is constantly changing. Uh, that's just something that we have to accept. And some terms that maybe are acceptable today could be unacceptable. Tomorrow, it takes conscientiousness just to check with the group that's most affected by this language and gauge the temperature that way. So how can we turn language into meaningful conversation? By talking. Depression isn't always about wanting to die every day. My depression looked like waking up every day and being like, oh, great, another day. I was really nervous about uploading a video about, you know, me talking about going on antidepressants, but I knew that because there were so many people that don't have the support or don't have these conversations being had in, within their own circle, by me creating a video, just speaking authentically about my own experiences, um, perhaps I could help someone in their own journey, wherever they are. Conversation is really underrated sometimes, but it's like the key to everything. It's the key to dismantling anything. It's the key to learning the history about something. We're seeing more characters in movies and in books and on TV shows who are battling some of these things. And it's just really helped to normalize it. We know that about one in five people have a mental illness. Yet for so many years, we pretended like it didn't exist. And now we're, that we're talking about it more, people are able to say, yeah, I've struggled with this too. We're just making it more everyday conversation than we have in the past. There's no judgment about seeing a dentist to take care of your teeth or seeing a doctor to take care of your blood pressure. Yet for so many years, there was this stigma of if you saw somebody for your mind, that somehow there was something wrong with you. You know, it shouldn't be this taboo thing that we're afraid to talk about. And I think that the more we welcome these conversations and the more we lean into sharing, you know, our experience with these things with the people around us, I think the more acceptable it's going to be to talk about these things making mental health just another societal norm.